So, Secretary of State, I just want to rest your voice as well, if that's OK, and go to General Poffley and uh, to Peter, if we can. Um, talking, we're going to talk about the Royal Marines briefly for a minute. Uh, firstly, General Poffley, can, I, can you explain to the committee how important, in your view... So, the Secretary of State, clearly, he will always go on military advice. You are the military advice. In your view, how important is the amphibious capability to both UK defence, but the industry, the wider industry that we've been talking about today? Well, I think uh, it goes without saying that um, the country places great value on having an amphibious capability. It's part of a suite of um, options that uh, policymakers can use, and it is quite clearly uh, one of our uh, major contributions as a tier one military nation. There is a the construct of it and its evolving nature uh, quite clearly will change with the operational environment uh, uh, and that has been uh, a continual case. In terms of the sort of industrial base uh, that leads underneath it, then quite clearly it maps very neatly into the work we've done on the National Shipbuilding Strategy and quite clearly as uh, the sponsor group of the National Shipbuilding uh, Strategy uh, looks at the forward programme of our maritime uh, expenditure and quite clearly the amphibious capability fits prominently inside that as befitting the significance of that. So role. would it be fair to say looking backwards over the last, so discount Afghanistan but certainly Iraq uh, and what we've done previously, the ability to secure the access to the beachhead, that, that, that capability, unique capability that we have has not only been um, uniquely relied on by our NATO allies such as Norway, the Netherlands and the US but it's been a fundamental part of operation. So I would say to you that it's not part of a suite of measures we have. It is one of the most vital things we have in, in our military today. It's that ability to secure the beachhead and project force onto the land. Because if you have your aircraft carriers and so on, it, it's all great. But unless you can get them ashore, they are therefore more than just a, one of a suite of capabilities. They are one of our major capabilities and recognised as such, in fact, by our allies. And I think that is reflected in the fact that we, in the 2015 SDSR, made significant provision inside the QEC programme to modify both the Queen Elizabeth and the Prince of Wales to accept an ability to, to deploy amphibious troops ashore. Indeed, we've increased the capacity over that that's provided by HMS Ocean in that role by some 200, 200 personnel. Mm. So, 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 so why now? Forgive me for cutting off because time is quite short, but why now are we looking at two ships with 30 years life expectancy in them that are recognised command and control um, nodes that um, enable this vital part of UK defence? Why are we looking? At, and, you, you know, we say it's speculation, and I absolutely agree with some of this speculation. However, in Brazil and Chile, they're already making plans, as reported today, to take these ships on. So clearly something is going on in the department. Why are we looking at these two core capabilities when, when you know, the, you yourself have just said, and if you look back over history, the cap that capability to have and project force is absolutely vital? Oh, well, for the point of clarification, I am not aware of any overture being made by either of those countries with regard to the uh, LPD. Well, how, how do they find out about it? It's not us, it's not me. Uh, I must... I, you would have to tell me. I am not aware of any of the overtures by either of those countries for, for those, those platforms. And with regard to uh, are we looking at those platforms, we look across the spectrum of capabilities as we are doing in the, in the capability review. And of course, uh, absolutely, and no one, no one, not expect no one us is not to look the at the fact this that we have to be very careful around money and defence now is not up for a debate. And I absolutely support you in that endeavour and you look at some areas of the military, 17 soldiers per every club, 30,000 vehicle platforms. I, I, I'm not going against the fact that you have to continually look at the threats and configure your military to that. But what I am saying is if there is a fundamental misunderstanding of amphibious warfare and a decision is taken to remove that from the options that are available to the Secretary of State and the Prime Minister in things like, you know, maybe they don't want to deploy a, a, one, of the big, um, one of the big aircraft carriers, but, but the, the options available to the Secretary of State and Prime Minister are going to significantly reduce should those two platforms go. And I, I do worry that that strand of amphibiosity that has been so important for this nation over the, not only the past you know, 50, 
30 years, but in fact the last 10, 15 years, you know, and, and only this summer in, in doing humanitarian operations. I do worry that that is going to not have the emphasis placed on it as much as it should do. Well, I can assure you that all of the chiefs are actively engaged in a debate on not just this capability, but a broad range, including the areas you've suggested, uh, to make sure that we are actually setting that priority right. And it is the first sea lord who will provide that expert advice into the chiefly committee. And indeed, the vice chief of the defence staff is a serving Royal Marine who is uh, quite clearly competent to be able to provide some counsel into that, that forum. If, if it weren't for financial considerations, nobody would be thinking of pensioning off these ships at this stage, would they? I think... Well, in the 2015 review, we made it clear that um, Bulwark would enter a period of low readiness from uh, last month, Indeed. and Albion would take over the role, so we're not, we were not anyway planning to deploy them both together. You've just heard General Poffley uh, tell you that the uh, Queen Elizabeth carriers will be able to carry more personnel than those ships. They will have larger armories, and uh, they will be able to carry more helicopters than those ships. So they will actually give us better literal capability than we have at the moment with Albion and Bulwark. No, I'm sorry, yeah, Secretary of State. I'm sorry, Secretary of State. There is no way that a Queen Elizabeth class carrier can substitute for the capabilities of the Albion and the Bulwark as a landing platform dock. Well, and just... uh, you didn't answer my question, which was, if it were not for financial considerations, then we wouldn't be considering withdrawing these ships. As recently as the 25th of January, the uh, Minister for Defence Procurement wrote to me because I'd heard a rumour about this mad scheme and raised it on the floor of the House of Commons. And she wrote and she said, there are no current plans to decommission the ships early and I can reassure you that their out of service dates are 2033 and 2034 respectively. So this is really all about there not being enough money in the defence budget, isn't it? No, it doesn't. This is speculation. Um, we've not had any proposals to get rid of either Albion or Bulwark have reached uh, my desk in any shape or form. So this is, at the moment, simply speculation. What we have said, and we said it in the 2015 review, that the carrier capability does add, in certain respects, to our literal capability. And I hope that's understood. Uh, How many carrier can, a carrier sorry, sorry, John, can, a carrier can take 900 mm. uh, men? Yeah. Um, and, and women, and, and, how many men and women, and can take more helicopters. Yes. And neither Albion nor Bulwark were involved in the Caribbean. And how many landing craft can the carrier take? And there is an absolute distinction here about how you deliver troops ashore, because it in uh, the landing platform dock, it absolutely has the capacity yeah. clearly to uh, deliver from uh, rotary but it most significantly has the capacity to deliver through landing yeah. craft. And the carrier does not have that capability, and we made that, I think, clear. So if you want to make, if you want to However, make a, a landing in the dead of night, quietly, on a, a, a part of the coast that um, uh, you wish to take people by surprise, uh, do you really think a fleet of uh, uh, troop-carrying helicopters is a substitute for silent landing craft coming in off purpose-built ships with built-in command centres designed for this special purpose. And it will be the judgment of the First Sea Lord and the Chief of Staff's Committee that will make a judgment as to whether they think that is an appropriate um, uh, operation, one in the contemporary and the future operating environment, and secondly, whether actually this is something that would be something that we would prioritise above other things. But we've had this exchange before. When you talk about the contemporary and the future operating environment, the truth of the matter is we don't have the faintest idea what crises will arise in the future. And some of them will require this sort of silent insertion of troops over a beach, which cannot be substituted by helicopters. And so I come back to the question again. Obviously, the answer should be to have both capacities. And if it weren't for a question of money, that is what we would be doing, isn't it? And we will examine both the capability of delivering troops from surface vessels as well as from rotary in the context of the prioritisations we make inside the capability review. Surface vessels with which can launch landing craft from indeed, a dock? Indeed. 
You wouldn't compare, for example, the capacity of the Bay-class ships with the Albion and the Bulwark to do that, would you? Uh, I would not in terms of scale of numbers of landing craft, right. but the capacity to deliver the same types of landing craft, albeit at a lesser scale, yeah, is provided for in the Bay-class RFAs. Yes, I, I know, but uh, the scale is the operative question. And this is about a judgment about the likelihood of deploying at scale in the circumstances such as you've described, and that again, as I come back to, will be a judgment the Chiefs will make. So, so well, are you making an assertion essentially that, um, if I don't understand you correctly, command and control and essentially the nodes that Albion bought, at, you know, what they were designed to do in the 30 years they've got coming, that is not replicated on the QE2, QE class carriers, is it? That is not replicated on the QE no. class. So that's, that's an, and, and that is one of our specific capabilities that our allies rely upon us for. Mm. If you've seen the uh, Americans' comments yesterday on, on this, this is one of our strategic assets and complements to NATO, isn't it? The C2 ability of those two platforms. Uh, they'd certainly bring a very capable C2 suite. Whether you could replicate it through other means is something that quite clearly... Ha, ha, what other means? How could well, you... you would need to provide a platform of a similar type if it is C2 of that type that you wish. Right, so we're talking about providing another platform. So if, if you were to if theoretically these platforms were to go, are you thinking about along the lines of retaining the capability so that we can go elsewhere? If I may, uh, this is purely speculative because okay. at the moment we're not having yeah. the conversation yet about the level yeah. of prioritisation. Of no, uh, you know, there's a range of different possibilities for all parts of the capability mm -hmm. suite that could go forward. Uh, quite clearly, Albion and Bulwark provide some very specific capabilities which, if they were not there, would either need to be replicated in a different form, or indeed, one would have to accept that you're taking a compromise in that part of yeah. our operational portfolio. Yeah. And so my concern is that when we're looking at options to conduct operations abroad, the military arm go to the Secretary of State, go to the Prime Minister with these options, and without those two specific assets, you are significantly withdrawing that range of options you can give people. And that will be a consideration that the Chiefs make when they consider any form of prioritisation of the capability suite. Okay. And the only reason they're having to consider this prioritisation is they haven't got enough money. No, it is because we have to consider the way in which, as I've said several times, the threats have intensified. We have to spend money on dealing with the threats from cyber as well as finding resources to storm beaches. It is for the chiefs to weigh these priorities up and then to give me the right military advice yeah. when so the decision comes. The threats have intensified in other domains apart from storming beaches. So if, there, so if there was enough money, you wouldn't have to consider sacrificing one thing in order to meet the other. And the question I want to put to you is this. Traditionally, it was always said that the chiefs of staff, if they were worried about uh, the state of the defence of the nation, retained the right as a body to demand to see the prime minister um, for the sake of obtaining more resources or at least, or at least, uh, sounding a warning that the country wasn't adequately resourced to defend itself. Do the Chiefs of Staff still retain that right? Well, they don't. Uh, I mean, they have every opportunity to make uh, representations through CDS uh, yeah, to me. Yeah, that wasn't my question. And, um, uh, of course, they, they would... No. I think technically, technically they, do. they do have the right, I think. Yeah. Because that, that, is, that is the concern here. You know, some of us are from that generation where you could argue Chief of the General Staff have not been prepared to say we can't do X, Y and Z. And some of us have paid a very heavy price for that. And so that is the concern now that actually we present a set of options. And it is simply not credible to say that an amphibious nation like ours, maritime nation, can do away with the capability that is so heavily relied upon. And do you, do you understand the impact that is going to have in the world of not only NATO, but the United States, and our standing as a military nation, if we say, right, that amphibious capability, granted, you can go and buy a roll-on, roll-off ferry from P&O tomorrow and paint it up green and roll the troops on. But that specific capability around Albion and Bulwark and the amphibious capability of the Royal Marines, you understand the effect that it's going to have strategically. Uh, I understand it is going to have a strategic effect if you were to take it in isolation. But I don't believe that we will be taking it in isolation. There will be a series of considerations that are made and the aggregate strategic effect will be that that really defines us as a tier one military nation.